Hi, welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. I'm your host, Sarah Buino. Today's guest, I met at Core Power Yoga. I don't know how you feel about Core Power Yoga. When I initially started going, I was thinking, oh, it's the McDonald's of yoga. And sure, it might still be the McDonald's of yoga. I appreciate convenience of the class schedules, first of all, but... I found some really amazing teachers there, so I don't want to knock core power yoga. I met Michelle Shea Walker. I think the first time I met her was during a restorative yoga class, and I remember her offering Reiki, and I was just like, mm, I need to know a little bit more about you, and I've been taking her classes for several years now, and just the other day was just like, hey, I think you need to be on the podcast, and she said yes. So that's how we got here today, and Michelle Shea Walker is a modern-day magic maker. She specializes in helping others heal through many metaphysical means such as Reiki, yoga, Akashic Records, and tarot. As an enabler of happiness, her optimistic intuition style is rooted in the belief that there are no negative readings, only opportunities for further growth and healing. I love that she calls herself a modern day magic maker and talks about her optimistic intuition. She truly is just a ray of sunshine. There's just something bright about her. And I think you're going to hear that in this interview. So please enjoy my time with Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. Hello. Happy to be here. Yay. It's a Tuesday for us, though this comes out on a Wednesday. But how's your Tuesday? Going well. It's Tuesday is a little bit of a free day for me. I just have one class. So it's nice to brainstorm and get involved in the other things that I'm doing in my life. Fabulous. Well, do you want to start off by telling the listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do? So my name is Michelle Shea Walker, and that is how I'm known on most of the platforms. And I am a little bit of everything involving sort of metaphysics, spirituality. I kind of have a hand in lots of different places. Primarily, I teach yoga, which is how we know each other. Mm -hmm. And I also do Reiki healing and Akashic Records readings and tarot mm. readings. So I have a whole side business that's more based around metaphysics and spiritual coaching is really how I like to think of it. I, rather than thinking mm -hmm. of myself as like a psychic or anything like that, like there's an element of that to it. There's a definitely an intuition to it. Mm -hmm. But I primarily think of all of these divination tools as a medium for coaching techniques. So very cool. How did you arrive here? Because I'm guessing you didn't wake up as a child one day and say, I'm going to be a metaphysics spiritual <laughs> coach. Go. Absolutely not. No. I mean, if we're going through the whole story, I do it, do had, it. I want to hear it all. Yeah. I had a very traditional Midwestern upbringing in the Christian church and definitely had a little bit of an inclination to things like that. Like I assume that every little girl grew up wanting to know more about crystals and tarot cards, but I guess maybe that's <laughs> not the case. <laughs> um, but I definitely was drawn to those things and drawn to sort of like witchy movies and characters on TV and anything that felt a little magical. But behind that, there was a lot of skepticism. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually a really interesting journey. I started with the yoga practice and it's everything along my journey. I've basically been totally rejecting of mm. the ideas originally when I first encountered them and Funny. then slowly opened up to them. Yeah. So it's like every single time I encounter someone that like doesn't really resonate with the things that I'm doing, I'm like, I get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was there. Yeah. So, I mean, it started with the yoga and yoga was one of those things that, you know, when I was in high school, it was super trendy. Like it was when Madonna was big into the yogi stuff and, mm. and it was kind of, in celebrity culture. So it was like a thing Hollywood was getting really into. And I was very into Hollywood at the time. Mm. And so I remember thinking, Oh, I'm going to try this yoga thing because all these celebrities are doing it. Yeah. And I purchased an intro to yoga DVD and hated it. I was bored out of my mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I came from a dance background. And so I kind of started yeah. doing it. I'm like, this isn't a workout. It's just stretching, which is so again, like when people say that to me now, I'm like, right. there's so much more, but I understand where you're coming from. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. But on surface level, I can see why you'd say that. Right. 
Absolutely. And so I didn't do yoga for several years. And then I'd actually gone through a period where I went through a really devastating breakup. And I'm a recovered codependent. And at the time I was deeply in a codependent tendency. And so there was this period of time after the breakup where I just I couldn't move like I had a regular workout routine, and I literally couldn't move my body in those ways. Wow. And I re-picked up that same DVD that I'd purchased in high school. And it was my salvation, not only for something to move, but something to kind of tap into that spiritual healing. Mm. And so that developed over the course of probably seven to 10 years. And then I became a yoga instructor. And then things started kind of in that really magical metaphysical way, spiraling into each other. So Mm. I went through my training and through the training, I met a fellow teacher who had trained in Reiki and had a very sort of underwhelming conversation with this teacher about the topic. <laughs> like oh, from wow. the way that we had the conversation, it makes no sense as to why I was like, oh, I'm going to do this. <laughs> huh. But for whatever reason, it resonated, even though the teacher was kind of just casual about it. Like they didn't really have a life-changing experience with their Reiki training, but were willing to give me the information. And Before I went through the training, I went to a class for the teacher that had been recommended to me, and she was doing a restorative yoga class with Reiki. Mm, Well, isn't that perfect? (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, that was kind of my thought process because I heard about the Reiki. And again, like those things that you don't even understand when you find this path, why it's calling out to you. Like the only reference that I had to Reiki, which I mean, just to pause for a second for listeners that don't know what Reiki is, Mm -hmm. it's a Japanese healing art. And it's basically about placing the hands on different energy centers in the body and balancing out the chakras. But the only reference I had prior to this conversation with this teacher was there's a joke on the TV show 30 Rock about Reiki. Oh, really? It's a one line thing. It doesn't even explain what it is. It's the first time I'd ever heard the word. But there's a moment where they're talking about how Liz Lemon needs to get a date. And so Jack, Alec Baldwin's character, says, you know, the Japanese believe that the laying hands on someone's body has healing qualities. It's called Reiki or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he's using this as an excuse to get her to go get human contact on date. So like, it has nothing to do with the actual practice of Reiki whatsoever. So through that, I went to a Reiki training and was incredibly skeptical of the whole process Mm -hmm. and still continued on through and was like, well, I'm just going to keep following this impulse. And then that ended up opening up a whole different awareness to my intuition. I realized Mm -hmm. that I was an empathic healer and things from my childhood started to make sense. Mm -hmm. Emotional connections that I'd had were suddenly translated for me. So, I mean, that's a lot in one little origin story, but everything kind of leads to the next. So it was like yoga yeah. into the Reiki and then Reiki into the intuition development. So that's the gist of it. <laughs> so being a therapist, they don't train us about intuition at all, but Absolutely, yes, it is about intuition, right? And like you have to do it to do your job. And I kind of experienced the same thing as I get more into spiritual work. I recognize, oh, I developed this intuition because nobody in my family was saying what was reality, but I was feeling it all the time. And I knew that even though my mom was putting on a happy face and saying everything's fine, I knew it wasn't. And so when my parents did get a divorce, it's like, oh, that's what I was feeling. So I totally relate with that. Like looking back finally, you know, in your 20s or 30s and being like, oh, I've had the power all along, just like Dorothy. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like you have a little bit of an empathic abilities as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I get words. Mm. If somebody is talking to me and there's a moment of silence and I'm like, what are you feeling? How does that feel? The word will just come and like literally the word pops in my head and then they say it. It's amazing. And it's not just like sad or happy, yes. you know, it's like disgruntled. Or it's, it's something very specific. How does it show up for you? I mean, first of all, I'd like to pause and say that means that you're clear cognizant. I don't know if you're yes. aware of the Wait, clairs. Yes. I thought that was clear sentient. <laughs> I mean, this is the definition as I know it and as I experienced it in my life. So clairsentient, I understand why you would correlate to that because clairsentient is clear feeling. So Mm. it's the empathic ability. So it's like actually feeling in your body, Mm, either the emotions of the other person or physical manifestations of those emotions in your body. Okay, which that happens too. So like you're picking up on the emotions of the world around you. And that's my primary source of intuition Mm -hmm. is is clairsentience. And I consider myself an empathic healer. So when I give someone Reiki, as I'm giving them Reiki, 
the way that I know what needs balanced out most is I'll get physical ailments mm. in my body based on what chakras are out of balance. So mm. like if their throat chakra is out of balance, my throat will get sore. Mm. And so it follows from there. So it's like, I know that most of the time my sensations are not their sensations. Like it's not right. that they have a sore throat. It's correlating to the energy or alternately I could get like, like super anxious around someone and oh, I'll be like, yes. why do you feel anxious? And I'll be like, oh, they feel anxious. And that was the thing that was probably the most interesting to try and correlate to my childhood, Mm. like retroactively. I mean, I'm an extroverted introvert, as they would call it. And so I do like spending time alone. And I would find myself after big group events coming home and feeling not just drained from being around people, but like ill. Like I would have queasiness and sore throats and headaches and just my whole body would ache after especially like I think the one that always sticks out in my memory is I went to Lollapalooza probably like eight, mm. nine years ago or something like that. And so I was there all three days and surrounded by people and all of these emotions because there's all this music happening. Yeah. And I would come home every night. And at the time I was with an extrovert. And so he thrived on all of that. And I would mm-hmm. come home just so depleted, but not just depleted, but feeling ill. And so I thought it was just a symptom of being an introvert and not wanting to be around people. And now I recognize that it's actually something that I can shield myself from the energy of others and maintain a relatively stable vibe if I'm going to be in those big group settings. But it's very valuable on a one-on-one basis when it comes to healing. I just wanted to interrupt because I literally had this conversation with a friend last week and he is not any way associated with the healing arts. And he was like, have you heard of this empath thing before? He's like, I feel sick at certain times. And I'm like, yeah, honey, this is a thing. And you, yeah, this is your intuition. He's like, what do I do about that? I'm like, go get Reiki. I literally bought him a Reiki certificate two years ago and he never used it. I'm like, get Reiki, start the process. There's something Mm -hmm. out there for you. And so as you're talking, I'm like, I can't wait to send him this MP3 as soon as we're done with this talk because he's going to be like, holy shit, I need to talk to Michelle. It's going to make so much sense now. And that's how I feel still to this day. I still have realizations that I'll like look back an event in my past and be like, oh, that was the empath abilities that was kicking Mm -hmm. in. I didn't know. So we all have a little bit of this. To some degree, we're all empathic as human beings. And Mm -hmm. so it's not something that's just, I always try to like tell people about my experience in a way that's true to me, but also be like, but I'm not saying this, like I'm special. (laughs) We're all experiencing. It's just a matter of how aware of it you are. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Once you learn how to tap into it, it Mm -hmm. becomes a superpower. Being empathic makes you more empathetic. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Because you really do start to feel when you know how to translate it, you know what the experience of the person that's sitting across from you or in the room with you feels like. And you can start to use those techniques to help them find their way to healing. So that's clairsentient. Claircognizant, which is what I think you're speaking to a little bit more, mm-hmm. is clear thinking as the translation. And so mm-hmm. it's that feeling like you've just had a thought drop down into your head, yeah. like from the cosmos. Yeah, like it's, they're deposited. Yeah. Yes. When you're like, I have no idea why I'm thinking about this right now, but this just came to me and it's relative to what's happening here. And that one's usually, I mean, it takes a lot of skill to start to recognize that as intuition because it feels like you're just thinking a random thought. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you've correlated that with your intuition and you know that it's a translation or you know that it's a powerful tool that you're using is a process to get to that. So like we don't Mm -hmm. all start there. So bravo to you. It's one of the things I'm really passionate about when I teach social workers is that it's not just about all the stuff you're learning in the book. It's about you are a tool and the gifts that you have are a tool. And like you said, everybody has them. You just have to tune into it and be aware of it. Absolutely. Yeah. And it takes practice and it takes a lot of self-awareness. Like I feel like the Mm -hmm. best healers are willing to go super deep into their own stuff because that's how you discover these things. That's how you learn these translations and deep dive into their own shit to be able to clear out the closet and be able to translate what's happening in their own body so that they can then use it to help others. Yeah, I just can't even imagine because that's the way I do it. And I finally came to this realization fairly recently that my healing is the priority here. And it's a positive consequence that I get to use that to help everybody else. I can't even imagine that there is a way you could be a skilled healer without knowing that, (laughs) knowing the pain. Occasionally, I get stories of people that have have had Reiki with other healers prior to coming to me, and it didn't, for whatever reason, resonate with them, or they had an experience that wasn't what they were expecting, or is Mm -hmm. different from what they experienced with me. 
And first of all, I'm of the mindset that nothing happens on accident. Like I've had people meet me and say, oh, I'm going to go to this healer instead. And then end up sometimes coming back to me and being like, oh, I should have come to you first. And I was like, no, Mm -hmm. if you would have come to me first, you wouldn't have appreciated it. Like there would have been something that was off about the experience. So I never think that there's any accident about someone going to a healer that doesn't resonate. It's ultimately part of the whole picture. But oftentimes the stories that I hear when healers sort of misinterpret or or get the messages wrong, it sounds like a lot of projection. And so I feel like as healers, the most important thing is being able to clean up your stuff so that you're not projecting it onto someone else. So that's ultimately what it comes down to. Yeah. And that's what we talk about as therapists is being able to like to truly be empathetic. You have to take your story off in order to take somebody else's on and to understand that. I love this fucking podcast because I get to have these sorts of conversations and realize just how similar so many of these professions are. Like I've talked to teachers and how it's so similar. You know what? I've even talked to sex workers about how similar it is, our profession. So we are all equal. Absolutely. Yeah. I've often had like little tangents in my brain where I'm like, how amazing would it be if I decided to become a stripper as a Reiki healer Mm -hmm. (laughs) and Mm -hmm. I could give lap dances with Reiki? Because it is, it's like all of this contact, all of these interactions, especially with one-on-one situations, regardless of what it is, has the potential to heal. And so it's just about how we use those in a proper way. And again, coming back to what you said about like being conscious of your own healing I have a mantra that I've been using for the past like year or so, which is in order to be the best at everything that I want to be and show up for the world in the way I want to do, I have to be radically selfish. Yeah. Like I have to be able to not only make my self-care and my healing a priority, but also by doing that, by tapping into the things that I am learning, that's how I teach the people that show up. I believe that we all attract the clients, the patients, whatever that are going through the similar vibrations that we are. And so if I'm not dealing with what I'm going through, I can't properly guide them through what they're going through because that's the reason that we connected is because we are we're having a similar experience. Oh, I totally believe that. I think I've said on here a million times that I might be discussing something with my therapist one day and then two days later be on the other side of the couch and being like, yeah, I just had this conversation with my therapist and here's what I learned, you know? <laughs> and I think, I don't know what I think. There's a lot that I think, but I'm just so excited to have this conversation. (laughs) To kind of pull that into the other stuff that I do with the tarot, people are always like, oh, well, how does it work? I do tarot card readings on YouTube. And so that's a massive reading for people that like aren't even in the room with me. Mm -hmm. And again, I come from a place of being the skeptic. And so I understand the skepticism, but it's by recognizing, by being a yoga teacher and a healer, that there are similar vibrations that are happening within the world at any given time. And and astrology is the same concept of like, at this given time, we're all experiencing this energy. It may not be showing up for all of us in the same way, but this is what we are experiencing. And that's how I'm able to do something like a YouTube tarot card reading and and trust that everyone who's watching it is going to find some sort of resonance with it. Because Mm -hmm. ultimately, like we have experience with coaching people, you have people coming in and you're like, oh my gosh, I just talked about this same topic. Topic. So like we're all experiencing similar things on a similar timeline. And it's just a matter of trying to find the core root lesson mm-hmm. so that we can all apply it to our vastly different situations. They're all really about the same core. Yeah. Two things on that. One is that I hear skeptics often saying like, well, you just read into your horoscope what you want to read. And it's like, yeah, that's the point. Like <laughs> that's how I make it <laughs> particular to me. That's exactly what it is. And then I guess the second thing is, can you talk a little bit about your journey from skepticism to believer? Because I, too, was a skeptic. I have always said, like, if you told me five years ago, I would be interested in Reiki and crystals and all these things. I would have told you you were full of shit. And now look at me. I cannot stop buying crystals on eBay. It's a problem. So what did that journey look like for you? Absolutely. So essentially, like I said, there were always little like signs that I was going to be into this. Mm -hmm. Like I was always into fantasy films and like anything that had sort of like an otherworldly resonance to it was my favorite stuff growing up. But then there was always this deep skepticism, which ultimately when I went through my first Reiki training, I now know as rooted in my solar plexus. So the, Mm. the power center, the energy center, that's all about our confidence. 
whenever I went through my own Reiki training. And so there's a lot of healing happening there. So ultimately the skepticism was coming from a lack of confidence. So yeah. there was essentially something within me that knew that I believed these things, knew that I found resonance, but didn't feel confident enough to not be a skeptic because what yeah. if someone else didn't agree with that? But yeah, the signs of the skepticism are just so hilarious because like I mentioned at first, I went to that Reiki restore class with what would soon become my Reiki teacher. And at the beginning of the class, she had mentioned something that I tell most of my clients when they come in for a session, you know, everyone's Reiki experience is different. Everyone feels more relaxed afterwards, but like depending on how open you are to the energy, some people will see visions or colors mm-hmm. and some people just have a nice chill time and some people go to sleep. So it's like everyone gets relaxed, but the experience as a whole is different based on your own awareness and your own ability to open up to that energy. Mm -hmm. And so I remember my first experience ever with Reiki. I'd never had anyone give me Reiki. And I remember thinking, oh, yeah, I feel a little more relaxed. But it was just like a relaxing tingling, like having like a warm bath or a good massage or something like that. It wasn't anything major. And then I was in the elevator leaving the building with three girls that came together that I did not know Mm -hmm. that were chatting amongst themselves about the experience. And I remember one of the girls turned to the other one and they're like, she saw colors. And I'm in the back of the elevator rolling my eyes like there's no fucking way she saw colors. (laughs) Wow. so skeptical because again like solar plexus experience of like I didn't experience it so you can't experience it and if Mm -hmm. other people aren't experiencing something that I'm experiencing then I'm not validated and so there's this whole mess of stuff that was coming up with that so that happened and then it was so crazy because then within like a couple months I was doing the Reiki training and then it was interesting because I went through a whole again solar plexus cleanse during that process so Mm -hmm. there was a bunch of insecurities that came up but essentially it was like just one step at a time like through the process of doing my own healing and finding myself seeing visions that I would encounter like months later or saying something to someone that came to me to heal that felt very off the cuff and vague to me, but had deep resonance for them. Like Mm -hmm. it was basically like a slow opening to, oh, this is really working. So Reiki has four different training levels. In level two, you learn how to send distance Reiki. So Mm -hmm. I can sit in my apartment and send Reiki across the country to a client, which I have several times. And again, the skeptic totally came out when I went to that training and they said that we were going to learn how to send it long distance. I was like, right. no, like I, I get it. Hugs are powerful. Touching people are powerful. I can understand how that would shift energy. But I was like, I really highly doubt that I can send it even across the room, let alone across right. the country. Right. And through that training, I was able to be on the receiving end of other people sending me distance Reiki. And so it was only through my own experience of being like, oh, I definitely felt that, Mm -hmm, (laughs) that mm -hmm. I was able to be like, oh no, this works. And so through experiencing things like that, if I wanted to go real deep into some research and if I was a very scientific mind, I could probably explain bits and pieces of it, Mm -hmm. especially if it was like physicist or metaphysicist or something like that. Like I could probably find ways to explain things, but ultimately it comes down to, I always believe whether it's coming from metaphysical experiences, or even something as simple as like shifting your diet, that you are your best laboratory. Mm -hmm. So like you can read all the experiences that you want and all of the research that you want, but ultimately what you experience in your body is going to be the best research that you're ever going to do. And so it's like, if it resonates for me, if I feel it working in my body, then I believe that it's now working and that I can trust it from now on because I've experienced it for myself. And we honestly, as a culture, we're just a bunch of brains walking around that aren't (laughs) feeling a lot of things. And so this is me. I'm going to be a jerk if you're a non-believer and say that it might be you. (laughs) Because we all do have bodies and energy is real. We know emotions are energy, you know, all these sorts of things. And Mm acupuncture has been a thing that works. So I think if people don't resonate with it, This is my codependent problem is that I think I have all the right answers. And if everyone would just listen to me, the world would be a better place. So (laughs) I think I might have a a little bit of that too. I know, right? I know. And I, I try to let go as much as I can. What I do with my clients is just an invitation, right? It's an invitation to try something different because this is a thing that has been proven to work. And there are physicists and metaphysicists like figuring out why it works. That's what quantum physics is, right? And so, yes, if you want to read all of it and you want to understand it with your prefrontal cortex, great. But what I often say to people is I just want to slap your brain right out of your head because it's really not helpful for what I'm trying to do with you. (laughs) I don't want your brain. Yeah, your body, your experience, 
the shifts that you're feeling in your in your being are going to be so much more. And honestly, like there are so many people out there that can understand things with their brain that don't feel great in their body. So like just because you have all right. of the knowledge in the world downloaded doesn't mean that you're living your best life. So it's like, how mm-hmm. do things feel? How do things resonate? How do you feel on an emotional and even physical level when you experience right. certain things? And that's how your body can tell you if it's good or bad for you. I still have the desire to know why and how it works. I remember the first time I got Reiki, I saw colors. And so I was blown away and I kept wanting to recreate the experience. So I would go to this healer and that healer and be like, okay, I want to see the colors. Now this, I saw a green triangle floating around. What does that mean? Like I wanted, (laughs) I wanted an exact answer and it took so long and not until I did my own training and probably not until level three that I was like, oh, the mind and body are one and there is no meaning and it's just like whatever. Like I finally just dropped into the piece of not knowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I also think that the knowing comes when you need it. Like there are some things that come up, particularly in a Reiki session that you don't necessarily need to know the meaning of everything. Like, because if we knew the meaning of everything that was going on in our energy, we would be overwhelmed with the to-do list or whatever it is that we thought that we needed to do. And so that was something that I had to come to as a healer as well, because I always give what I call an energy recap at the end of my sessions. And and not Mm. all healers that some healers just treat it like a massage. Like you've gotten your healing and you're sent on your way. But again, like I'm the same way, like I like to understand things. I like to kind of break things down. But I had to learn over the course of several different sessions and several different recaps that Mm -hmm. I don't need to share everything that's coming through. Because if I were to share everything that's coming through, people are trying so hard to make sure that they do everything right and they they fix whatever they can fix. They're going to forget the important stuff if I tell them the slightly less meaningful stuff. I mean, first of all, when you do a healing session, you're dealing with several different layers of things. You're dealing with chronic stuff that's happening in someone's energy. And you're also dealing with just like the very, very, very surface stuff that could be what they had in a conversation earlier that day. I would much rather focus on the bigger stuff rather than like, oh, your throat chakra was just a little clogged because you probably had a tiff with your partner earlier today. If you tell someone everything, and myself included, if someone were to tell me everything that was going on in my energy, my brain would explode trying to like make a to-do list of things that I needed to work on. (laughs) I think with all healing, it's sort of like the triage experience. Like you're going in and like, what needs the most attention? What is the most vital, most pressing issue? And let's focus on that and maybe layer a couple other things on top of that. But ultimately, like you don't want to overwhelm someone with all of the knowledge and all of the symbolism. And sometimes as healers, I think that even translating it, we don't get to know what everything was because it's just not important. It doesn't matter. (laughs) At this moment, it doesn't matter. Maybe we'll get to it later, but maybe right now you don't need to know what green triangles mean. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And speaking of being overwhelmed, I'm curious if you would share with the listeners, what's your energy hygiene routine? Because you said that you found a way to kind of keep yourself safe from from getting other people's energies. I think that might be really helpful. First things first, water is vital. So if you find that you are picking up on other people's energy a lot, both drinking water, staying hydrated, and baths and showers are super, super helpful in cleansing the energy. And this is something that I didn't fully tap into until probably three or four years into teaching. And so I would be teaching yoga and touching all these people and giving all this Reiki. And obviously, even teaching yoga and getting sweaty throughout the day, like there's only so many showers in the day that you want to take. Right. <laughs> you shower in the morning and it's like, how many showers should I be taking? And so there would be times that I would do a couple classes and then take my second shower of the day and then be like, well, I'm not going to take a third shower like at the end of the night. And so I've learned that the end of the day shower is almost vital for me if I've mm-hmm. been healing or teaching in any way. And it does mean that I use a little extra coconut oil throughout the winter months, especially because I'm usually showering at least twice a day. Mm. And you know, if you found that it was helpful, maybe you just switch your showers to the end of the day, but it's definitely the quickest way to release the energy of other people, especially if I've been out in public and I can't even tell where the energy came from and I have Mm. all these aches and pains, nothing releases it quicker than a shower. Sometimes it's just like literally hop in and hop out. Like as long as the water is on my body, it rinses it off. Mm -hmm. So energy does kind of leave like a film (laughs) on your being. And so like the water is a really cleansing process. The other thing I would say is just being really aware of how open your own energy is, because while we don't have to like wall ourselves off to people, it's just an awareness of when you are just wide open 
for anyone that walks through mm-hmm. and, and when you need to kind of like shut down. And it doesn't really necessarily have anything to do with good versus bad energy right. as what you're letting in. Sometimes the best people in our lives are the ones that we need to kind of shut the energy down a little bit with just because you need to maintain something for yourself. Mm-hmm. So I actually had a dear friend recently that I did an Akashic Records reading for him. And he was a very, very open hearted, pure hearted soul and very loving and very caring. But because of that, what I saw on his records is that his heart was almost like this open room that anyone mm-hmm. could just walk in and throw a party and like do whatever they wanted. And there was no space for himself. And so one of the things that we worked on is I told him to make sure to build inside his heart, so build a room inside his heart and, and keep that just for him. And I think that's good advice for all of us. No matter how much you trust the people around you, it's not about trust. It's not about being able to open up to good energy. It's about you always need something to like maintain for yourself. Spoken like a good codependent in recovery. Yes, absolutely. Making sure there's always something for yourself and that you're not just giving it all away or opening it up for everyone. And it's definitely a process. And it's a process of like learning like this particular friend, like we've talked about, like, oh, make the room a little bit bigger and add a Mm -hmm. skylight and like (laughs) whatever you can visualize. And then the final thing, what I'd say has to do with visualizations, the more that you can visualize any sort of protection around you Mm -hmm. or... I'm a big believer in creating meaning to things that wouldn't necessarily have meaning. So I believe, I guess what comes to mind, like the practical magic, the star Mm -hmm. has power because you believe it does. Yeah. I believe we can assign powerful protection to anything that we want. So like, yeah, there are crystals that are protective. There are things like that. But like, I have a fake leather jacket because I'm vegan, but I have a fake leather jacket that I just told myself that this repels energy. Mm -hmm. And so if I have that jacket on and I feel like I'm surrounded by too much energy, I'll zipper it up and I'll just make sure that I'm protected in that way. Or I also just do visualizations of imagining a glass cylinder coming down around my body and just disconnecting all of the cords that I've picked up on throughout the day. So Hmm. visualizations and and creating your own rituals and your own meaning behind maybe things that you wear or do every day are really powerful as well, because a lot of it is the mind and the energy that's connected to the thing. So Mm -hmm. like the more you can shift your mindset, the more that the energy starts to shift. And then I would say the final thing is, this is a recent shift that I've had where I went from thinking of trying to like block out negative energy to instead thinking of pushing so much love out from my being Hmm. that it pushes all the negative energy away. I love that. And it's because whenever I would get into this mindset of like, I got to block it, I got to block the negative energy. First of all, you're just focusing on the negative at that point. Like you're focusing on all all the negative stuff that's coming through. And so that ends up Mm. being what you're manifesting because that's what you're looking at. And I would also feel like I would get smaller. Like I would feel like Mm. I was contracting because I was trying to protect myself from that Mm. negative energy. And so instead it's like, no, just develop so much good vibes and so much love in your energy that you just sort of give yourself like a glint of the good witch bubble around yeah. your body. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to steal that. I love it. You should. <laughs> so yeah. So develop that glint of the good witch bubble around your body so that you're pushing out love and then you're doing twofold. Like not only are you protecting your own energy from any negative vibes, but you also are kind of healing other people around you yeah. in that way as well. Because ultimately someone's going to feel that someone's going to feel that love, whether you even interact with them or not. Dig. Totally yeah. dig. <laughs> well, Let's shift into, we've thrown around the word healer a bunch of times and healing already, but how do you feel about the term healer as applied to what you do? I think it's fitting on all fronts. Cause again, I like to look at everything that I do, the yoga, the Reiki, the readings, both tarot and Akashic as coaching tools. And I came from a background prior to becoming a yoga teacher. I was a holistic health coach. And oh. so, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when I got bored with those methods and I started looking more into the spirit, it's like essentially everything is the same thing. It's all just coaching Mm. tools. Oh yeah. Yes. It's all healing. I've spoken for myself going through my own heartbreak. Yoga was immensely healing for me. And so I try to cultivate that in my classrooms. And I think of my life as before and after Reiki. There was such a shift in my energy based on that modality that like, there's no way that I could not think of that as a healing balm. And then tarot, again, is I think anything that's coaching you in the right direction is going to be healing. Mm -hmm. Anything that's helping you to find a different perspective on the path that you're currently on and the circumstance you currently find yourself in Mm -hmm. is is ultimately going to help you to not only heal, but grow and expand because that's ultimately why we're here. I'm so glad to hear you say that because I've done enough of these interviews now where so many people push the word away. 
And I'm trying to figure out exactly what that is. But a lot of what people will say is, no, I'm not a healer. I'm just a conduit or I'm a vessel or I'm a person holding space for the healing. And that's what I mean when I say I'm a healer too. So it's just, there's something specific in there in the way that we're translating it that I really wish we could all open up to being like, yeah, I'm a fucking healer because I think ownership of that is important. It is. Yeah. And I think that especially when it comes to the spiritual community, Mm -hmm. we tend to have this sense of needing to humble or get rid of the ego or something like that. And Mm -hmm. so I think sometimes, unfortunately, that translates to not taking credit for the things that we are doing. Because even if you are just a vessel for healing energy, which ultimately they say Reiki, we're just channeling universal Reiki healing, Mm -hmm. that's still something worth taking credit for. (laughs) Like, an immense amount of work that goes into being a vessel. And Mm -hmm. so even if you feel like the ultimate source of the healing is coming from another area, you're a vital portion of that healing. Yeah. So I think even as being a channel or being a conduit or holding space, you are still a healer because you're still ultimately participating in the healing of yourself and others. But again, I also believe that semantics is fluid. So like whatever makes you feel comfortable is comfortable. But my personal Mm -hmm. viewpoint and definition would be like own that, own that power. (laughs) Even if it's not coming from you, like take that claim and be like, yes, I am creating this change and I am doing important things in the world. And without me, that process wouldn't be happening. You just made me think, I wonder if my pushback kind of comes from I grew up in a Christian household as well, where to be meek and to be humble Mm -hmm. was treasured. But my mom's interpretation of humility was to be a doormat and to put everyone else Mm -hmm. before her at all costs, like talk about codependent. And seeing that, it made me angry because even though she was saying that these things made her happy, they didn't. They killed her. She got cancer and died at 62. I truly believe she died of codependency because she never, ever got her own needs met. And I think I have anger at her for not asking to get her needs met. And so I think when I hear, especially women, not being willing to step into that power, I think I'm like defensive, like, no, you motherfucker, you are a healer. And I want you to feel that way. And I want us all to be able to like, because it's not ego to say, this is what I'm good at. My example that my husband, if he were looking at me right now, he'd be shaking his head like, do not tell people this. But I think I've said this before on the (laughs) podcast. I'm a really fucking good singer. And that is the one thing in my life that I've been able to say, like, I don't feel a need to sugarcoat it. I don't feel a need to apologize for it. I'm really good. And it's partly God given talent and partly I worked really hard to cultivate skill. Absolutely. But I'm not saying it from a place of ego because I think the ego piece would be I am better than you. Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you that it's a fact that I'm a really good singer. And I wish that I could say that as a therapist, too. But there's a piece that because as a therapist, I have power over people, quote unquote. I don't feel that way, but that's what the role gives me. And so I guess as a healer, too, that might be the other piece of it is this power differential. If I then unabashedly say I'm a really fucking good therapist, then because I have power over someone else, that that might be threatening. And I wonder, I'm just coming to this now, Michelle, you have just lit a fire under me. But I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? It's interesting because I almost wonder if the hesitance for saying something like I'm a really good therapist might be because it is a partnership. That thought occurred to me. Maybe that's also the healer hesitation as well. Because not only were you partnering with some sort of higher energy, but you're also partnering with the person that you are healing or coaching or whatever. Your client's part of that healing process. Yeah. And so I think that it's possible to own the label of healer, but also recognize that your healing capacity has to do with your client's capacity to be ready to be healed. Right. I also don't think that one shouldn't be reliant on the other one fully. Mm -hmm. Like the overall experience of that particular circumstance is going to definitely develop based on both of the people's ability to heal and be healed. Yeah. That doesn't mean, and that's something that I actually tell a lot of my Reiki students because I train people as well as I say, just because someone's not receiving the Reiki energy doesn't mean that you're not giving Reiki. Like there are some times that someone will just simply be blocking the energy for whatever reasons. They're not ready. They're skeptical. And it doesn't make you a bad healer and it doesn't make them a bad client. It just means that the timing is off and that they're not ready to open up to that type of energy. They're not ready to heal. They're not ready to look at that part of themselves. 
And that's just timing. So when you said it as a basis of a therapist, like I still believe that you should be able to get to a place where you own it, but it made more sense to me as to why there might be a hesitation because your label of a really good therapist, people might want evidence of that and be like, Oh, I mean, not that they wouldn't have it for that, but like the fear there is what if I make that claim and then I meet someone that I can't be a good therapist to because of their yeah. things that they have going on and what they're blocking. And then the fear is looking like a fraud because this one person can say, oh, I wasn't magically healed by this person. And it goes with all healing. Yeah. And it's all about what other people think because I know that I've had clients before that I wasn't able to help. And I know that it wasn't me. I know that it was because at whatever mm-hmm. point in their journey, they weren't ready. But you're right. It's about if I make that claim and then somebody proves me wrong, that's, yeah, that's Mm -hmm. it. It's a fact, but it's a subjective fact. Yeah. Whereas something like I'm a really fucking good singer, we kind of have sort of like a Mm -hmm. guideline for that. Mm -hmm. You're more capable of like making that claim without the fear because we all kind of sort of agree upon what a good singer sounds sounds like. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I also think that there's the mindset of like healing and therapy and all of these modalities. We have so many different perspectives on these things. I still come from a household where when I went into therapy for a time period, my parents were sort of afraid. Yeah. They were unsupportive, but they were kind of like, well, what's going wrong? Like right. from that mindset of like, there's something broken or there's something that needs to be fixed. And that's why you go to therapy. And oftentimes that's helpful, but that's not always the case. And so because we have this sort of mindset where we're not really clearly defining what's good and what's bad and like it's really Mm -hmm. hard to get the whole storyline there with something like healing and coaching and therapy in order to make a full assessment of how good that person's abilities are, you would have to talk to not just the healer, but also the healee Mm -hmm. and probably try and consult other sources outside of that because they're going to have their own conflicting stories as well. So it's almost like you have to be a fly on the wall (laughs) and completely have an objective viewpoint of everything that occurred in order to be able to fully make that statement or to fully support that statement. And so ultimately it comes down to you have to decide for yourself what a good healer looks like. And then you can be able to make that claim based on what it is that you have defined for yourself. No, you just made me even more so want to do a research project so I can actually operationalize it. <laughs> That's what you did. You lit a fire under my ass again. Like, I know I'm going to fucking figure this out. It's It's funny. I feel like part of my role in this lifetime is to because I was born a skeptic and not necessarily into these things and do have a very logical mind, but also love the magic and embrace it and have mm-hmm. begun to believe in it. Like, I think part of my job is to marry those things for people. So I want to do that. Do you have Gemini somewhere in your chart? Uh, <laughs> no, but I'm an Aquarius. And so Gemini is like my BFF. Do you happen to know what your North Node is? That's like real deep astrology. Ooh, but I don't. I have my, my charts upstairs. If I had it, I would pull I would it out. I almost wonder if your North Node is Gemini because I have a North Node Gemini and it's because the Geminis are very much the communicators, the teachers and the translators mm-hmm. of the Zodiac. And so the North Node is essentially the karma that you've been brought into this life to sort of like overcome and sort of like a life goal. The opposite of that is what you have experienced in past lives. So like, Mm. this is getting a little, I love just trying to do a little glaze over this in-depth version of astrology. So there's the North Node and the South Node. And the South Node is ultimately the sign that's completely opposite of whatever your North Node is. And so the South Node dictates the things that you came into this life being skilled at. Like Mm. you've done several lifetimes working on these things. And then the North Node is the opposite energy to that. And so it's like your karma this lifetime is to try and incorporate as much of the Mm. opposite energy from what you've been. But it also ends up being part of your life path. And so I wouldn't be surprised if you have some Gemini somewhere in your chart, whether it be your Mercury, your North Node, or maybe even your Midheaven, which is sort of like your life purpose as well. But yeah, I fully resonate with that idea of like, Mm -hmm. oh, I need to translate this for you. I need to find a way to help understand this, even if it's a concept that's completely foreign to you. I'm a big fan of metaphors for that reason. So it's like anytime I'm trying to like explain something to someone, I try to like take it back to like, okay, what's the reference point? Where can I find the metaphor that like at least Mm -hmm. sort of helps them to grasp this concept? Yeah. Well, I have to ask the question about wounded healer and how you feel about that term. 
I mean, I think that we're all wounded healers. I think that in order to be Mm -hmm. a good healer, you have your own wounds that you've already worked to heal. And we kind of, without even talking about the That's true. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about it earlier with like, you have to be able to, first of all, recognize your wounds because if you're not recognizing your wounds, you're going to be projecting those wounds all over the people that you're trying to heal Mm -hmm. in a way that's not necessarily clear or not necessarily healthy. And ultimately it's our wounds that make us these more in-depth and spiritually awakened creatures because it's only through searching to heal those wounds that we become so involved in these different aspects of things and so aware of our own selves and then therefore aware of humanity as a whole because the more you dissect yourself, the more you become that radically selfish person that's always examining how you're working within the world, the more you recognize how other people work in the world as well. And so I think that the two terms don't necessarily have to be stated together, but they're always going to be found together. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. (sighs) Is there, I mean, we talked about a lot of shit. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you want to make sure that you say today? I mean, ultimately, I think that anytime that anyone's searching for any sort of healing, First, make sure that you have absolute resonance with the person that you're seeking the healing from because there Mm -hmm. is a healer out there for everyone, as we talked about earlier. Yeah. We're going through the same things that our clients are going through. And so not all healers are created equal. And that doesn't mean that Mm -hmm. any healer is better or worse than the other. Mm -hmm. It just means there are healers that are out there specifically for you. And then there are healers that are out there for other people. And if you try to rush the process or if you try to go to the healer that everyone you know has gone to or like the celebrities have all gone to, they may not have a resonance for you and they may not have as much to offer you as the person that you just kind of sit down with and you're like, I feel something when we connect and like this feels right. Like you have to trust your instincts when it comes to that. And then through that process, you also have to trust yourself. Essentially, the process of trusting your instincts and finding your healer is going to help you to trust your healer because you're going to see things mirrored back at you from your healer that you have in yourself. The whole process of trusting yourself, trusting them, and then also letting your trust in them embellish and enliven and strengthen your trust in yourself. So I think that that's really, really important is finding that resonance and looking at everything as a tool and looking at it as everything as an opportunity for growth. One of my favorite things to see about the tarot is there are no negative cards. There's only opportunities for growth. Yeah. Because even when you're going through the darkest part of your life, it's offering you something to heal, something to grow, something to become more of the person that you were put on this planet to be. And so if we stop looking at negative experiences, negative predictions Mm -hmm. and negative things Mm -hmm. as something that's like the end of the world, they're actually opening up an entirely new world to us. It's kind of like in tarot, the death card is never really about death. It's about rebirth. And so it's like even the most negative thing that we can possibly think about occurring in our life is ultimately about a rebirth and a restart and a fresh new energy and moving more and more towards whatever it is that we're here to do. Amen. (laughs) But yeah, I totally agree with all of that. Oh my God, this has been so fun. And I'm totally going to need you to read my Akashic Records. So I will make an appointment very soon. Absolutely. And I do a whole thing where I can do a combination of all three too. (gasps) What? A little bit of Reiki. It's whatever Reiki that you need. So it's like a distance Reiki for usually about 15 minutes. So I just get the gist and kind of smooth some things over. And then after that, we talk on a phone or Skype and essentially all of my talents are open. So it's like I open the records, I get out the tarot cards and anything that needs to be answered, get answered. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) I'm ready in five minutes. Just kidding. That's good. (laughs) So if people wanted to schedule sessions with you, where do they find you? They go to michelleshaywalker.com and that's Shay like Shea Butter, S-H-E-A. And then they can also follow me on Instagram at Michelle Shea, also Shay like Shea Butter. Because that's a lot of times where I announce most of my sales or events or anything like that that might be happening that I haven't had time to promote on the website. Amazing. You're so amazing. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. (laughs) This was really fun. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about all this because it's not often I get to deep dive into my experience. Well, anytime, if you're like, I need to deep dive, I'm your girl. Sounds awesome. (laughs) Thank you so much to my guest, Michelle, for joining us today. And thank you for listening. 
And as always, thanks to Andrea Clunder and Edwin Ruiz at the Creative Imposter Studios for editing, to my friend Liam O'Donnell for that awesome album art photo, and to Ben Mueller for our theme music. To find out more about Michelle or any other guests, you can visit our website at www.headhearttherapy.com slash podcast. And please, if you have a second, give us a shout out in some way, whether that's to review us on Apple Podcast or to connect with us on Instagram or Twitter or any of the amazing places that you're connecting with people. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much. Till next time. Mm-hmm.